Our next teacher is an entrepreneur and Bitcoin evangelist. He is the CEO of Tokenly, and he's the founder of Let's Talk Bitcoin Show, which is happening in this room tonight. We hope to see you there. It is my great pleasure to introduce Adam B. Levine. Good morning. <laughs> All right. So today we're going to be talking about sort of the past, present, and potentially future of token types. Mostly this is going to be kind of a retrospective of my experience over the last seven or eight years, kind of watching this industry mature and going from thinking we knew what we were doing to realizing we had no idea what we were doing to realizing that actually a lot of people had gotten themselves into trouble um, and kind of where we are now in the current state of things. <clears throat> so my name is Adam B. Levine. <laughs> I'm the creator of the Let's Talk Bitcoin show, which I founded in September, in uh, April of 2013, um, along with Andreas Antonopoulos and Stephanie Murphy. Um, the goal, the goal of uh, starting the show was to um, help people really understand the ideas that were being talked about. Because at the time that we got started, there were actually no podcasts talking about Bitcoin or cryptocurrency in general. And there were a lot of engineers who had really interesting ideas that nobody could understand except for other engineers. And so the first th thing that we really focused on was drilling into that, was helping these people to actually express their ideas in a way that was as intelligent as the ideas were. And that was the right kind of place, right kind of time. We were very successful. Within about, um, within about a year, I had turned the network, sorry, I had turned the one show into a network because we had uh, gotten big enough to do that. And then the spring of that year, we uh, launched a token, one of the first large-scale uses of tokens, if not the first large-scale uses of tokens, in spring of 2014 called LTB Coin, which was an incentivization program for both content creators on the platform and for um, people who are community members who are just using the platform. Um, starting that at such an early time sent me down a rabbit hole of figuring out what it would take to actually enact something like that in real life. And while we did launch in spring of 2014, it took me until 2016 to build out everything that we had needed. And that was where the company Tokenly came from. It started as an open source project, became a, you know, attempt to actually create tools that would be used by basically everybody. Because the use case stuff that we had been so focused on, while it was specific to media, the tools that we had been building were actually generalized to everything and every token use case needed them. So, as you probably guessed, <laughs> I've been obsessed with tokens for a very long time. Um, and in kind of being on both the journalist side and helping other people explain their ideas and then going down the entrepreneurial side to explore my own ideas and the difficulties in building those out and getting them implemented in real life, I have a pretty comprehensive understanding of the challenges uh, and kind of the, uh, the history that's come before. So this talk, uh, like I said, we're going to start at the relatively beginning. Um, today we'll be doing a deep dive into the nuanced world of token taxonomy. Within the cryptocurrency community, if you hear someone talking about tokens, chances are pretty good they're talking about a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin, a utility token, which are sometimes referred to generally as ICOs, or a security token or a securitized token offering, better known today as STOs. While each of these types of tokens are different, they can all be thought of as blockchain tokens because in one way or another, they record the record of each token's ownership is recorded and maintained within a blockchain or something similar. So why do people use tokens today? Uh, there are a couple of different use cases, some of which are better understood, some of which are still very new despite having been around for a while. Um, the redeemable use case is the one that we are the most familiar with. It's the Bitcoin use case, it's the cryptocurrency use case, it's the I hold something and it is valuable to me when I spend it. Uh, other than that, it has no utility, it's just sitting there waiting to be spent. Um, token controlled access is kind of the opposite of that idea and it's something that we still don't see too often. It's the idea of holding a token being possession of a digital item that ties back to that token for its uh, authenticity, basically. So, for example, uh, you could imagine this as a token as a password, right? As a password that can be traded to someone else. And in the early days, the way that we implemented this concept was in a, in a, a token control access forum system where we had a common forum system where there were multiple groups of people who all kind of disagreed with each other because they all had their own niches that they were interested in. And we made it possible for anybody to take any token, whether they had created it or not, and to create a forum of their own which only people who had that token or the combination of tokens in the appropriate quantities could access. And so in this way, we didn't even know what was going on. And it was a way to essentially create 
this uh, tokenized ecosystem, centralized tokenized ecosystem, because we were still providing the forms and stuff like that, but the authentication and the membership and stuff like that, we had no idea about and frankly didn't care. So that's kind of token control access. We see that more commonly today in things like CryptoKitties, um, but you can also think of that as numismatic or collectibles, right? Things where the utility isn't even really utility, it's more just, I like this thing. And that kind of leads us to the last part, which is sometimes people get tokens just because they like the name. <laughs> And especially early on in token systems, that is like the primary use case is, hey, I want to get Coca-Cola, or I want to get you know, website or designer or something like that. And as somebody who owns about 400 asset names of exactly that type, I can tell you that it's not always a great idea, but it is a lot of fun in the early days. <laughs> um, so um, in the future, we're going to see things like revenue streams, we're going to see equities, and we're going to see lots of other stuff that we haven't even really thought of yet. The challenge on everything that I have mentioned there on the future side has nothing to do with the technology. The technology has been able to do this for about five years now. The challenge is always on the regulatory side and on the, on the permission side. Because disruptive technologies, if they can be stopped, typically are stopped because the disruption comes at the expense of someone who benefits from it. So while blockchain tokens themselves are a relatively new thing, with Bitcoin as the first to originate in 2008, tokens themselves are actually a remarkably ancient way of tracking and exchanging value. So before we get into the modern stuff, I just want to briefly touch on that. So these are three examples of different types of tokens throughout history. Um, the first is money, right? Very simple. Um, and uh, you know, people sometimes confuse the idea that early money was made of gold because the gold was valuable, when in reality it was because the gold was scarce and it was a good anti-counterfeiting measure, uh, relatively speaking, you know, relative to the, to the time. Um, the next picture is a picture of stone money on the island of Yap. Show of hands, who's familiar with the story of Yap? Okay, so it looks like about a third of the people here, so I'll just tell real briefly. Um, so a blockchain is a consensus method, so it's a way where we all agree on, uh, on what is truth, right? And in, in Bitcoin, this is an automated process. But on the island of Yap, actually it's a series of islands, um, there is a consensus-based or was a consensus-based money as well, which were these very, very large stone disks, which were not native to the islands that they were money on. And so the way that they would generate this money, the way they would mine this money, is people would take canoes and go over to the islands where the stone was found, mine it there, then bring it back on a bunch of canoes and, uh, and then set it up in front of somebody's house. And when you wanted to spend it, you didn't move it, you didn't give it to anybody because that was non-feasible. Again, anti-counterfeit measure. Um, instead, what you did is, um, is you just told everybody that you knew. And the guy you were selling it to or you, who was, you were paying it to told everybody he knew. And it was a small enough network that just this kind of interpersonal person-to-person -person thing meant that very quickly you wound up with a system where even though the money never moved and it was always in front of Bob's house or whatever, you always knew whose money was the money in front of Bob's house at the time. So that's kind of an early example of a consensus-based token system where there was no, so, so even then, you never needed to hand somebody money in order to use it, but you did need to have a coordination mechanism that could sustain that sort of thing. So the last one is a stamp. This is a very early utility token. And effectively what it is, it's a tokenization of the uh, prepayment of a uh, you know, parcel or you know, uh, package delivery uh, or letter delivery <laughs> over a specific uh, postal network. Um, and so in this way, you know, you buy it and then you hold it as a token. If you wanted to sell it to somebody else, you could do that. Um, and then similarly, when you want to use it, you apply it to the thing and then that's effectively the redemption process for getting the value from that. So uh, based on what we've talked about so far, are there any questions? Seeing none, we'll continue. Okay, moving on to modern or blockchain tokens. This is something that I didn't think was controversial, but maybe it is. So I actually view Bitcoin, Ethereum, and other things like that as a type of token. I view it as a tokenization of money and of a different type than what we see typically on the layer two or the meta layer. So typically when I'm thinking about cryptocurrency, everything is a token. And it's just a question of what's the use case for the token and what layer does it exist on. So from uh, the defining factor of a layer one or native token, as I would call any of these things, um, is that it is defined by the protocol, right? Um, and it is used by the protocol. So the Bitcoin protocol, for example, awards all newly created tokens, which are called Bitcoins, to miners who perform the work of maintaining and operating the network. If you want to transfer tokens on the Bitcoin network, you also need to pay a small amount of Bitcoin, similarly, similarly to how you would pay for a letter by applying a stamp. 
Without the Bitcoin token, the Bitcoin blockchain literally doesn't work because there's no incentive to actually perpetuate the whole scheme. So layer one or native tokens are inherently important to the underlying blockchain and typically the blockchain cannot function without them doing that job. Are there any questions about layer one tokens or that sort of definition? Sure, Ethereum is the other obvious example. Um, Ethereum, if you want to send any, and really any sort of, uh, anything like that. So Ethereum, anything where you have to pay a transaction fee and you pay the transaction fee in the token, that is almost always a layer one token. There's one exception to that once we get into the smart contracts part of this talk, but I'll address that at that point. Uh, okay, so moving on to meta protocols, meta tokens, or L2 tokens. From very early in Bitcoin's history, there were ideas and plans to build new, more flexible systems to create Bitcoin-like tokens without the need for a new full blockchain and minor infrastructure with all the costs that those entail. In the early days, many people wanted to create new tokens for many reasons, but the only practical way to do it was to borrow Bitcoin's open source code, change the name, the logo, and launch your own basically competing network. So whereas in 2005 it was impossible to create a Bitcoin-like token and network, five years later it was almost a trivial task for your average enthusiast developer, if not one very likely to succeed. Many people created many altcoins, and there were a few interesting, interesting experiments like PrimeCoin, uh, which transformed the proof of work being done by blockchain mining into valuable scientific data, or the early experiments in, to proof of stake or other sort of novel consensus methods that tried to go beyond what Bitcoin had introduced with proof of work. Most projects, though, were like Goldcoin, which was quite literally like Bitcoin, but with the word gold in the name as its compelling adoption thesis. I, I'm totally not kidding about that. I did a deep dive on this and like uh, six years ago, trying to figure out like, why are you people interested in this? And that was literally the reason over and over again was because the word gold has value. So <laughs> not everything has value is what we, we learned is that it's actually kind of hard. Okay, so in the summer of 2013, MasterCoin, which is now known as Omni, launched the first initial coin offering fundraiser. For every Bitcoin you donated, you got 100 MasterCoins back. And they raised about $500,000 worth of Bitcoin that would then become $5 million worth of Bitcoin in the months they were staffing up. While the protocol would launch and be used to raise funds by a few early projects like MadeSafe and Factum, within 18 months, the money that was actually being spent on MasterCoin would be gone, and the project largely set adrift with volunteer maintainers. MasterCoin was the first practical meta-token protocol. A meta-token protocol is a new set of rules that uses Bitcoin or something like it as its blockchain layer and builds additional optional rules and capabilities on top of it. This means that a token built on top of something like Bitcoin, or Ethereum for that matter, doesn't need to be given to miners just to run the network, which makes it possible for these tokens to be used. Oops, dropping this. Uh, which makes it possible for these tokens to be used in basically any kind of system. Um, getting your information recorded in a blockchain, though, is never going to be free. So since we're not paying the miners in the token, we still need to pay them and in the manner they expect. So for tokens like Bitcoin, uh, so for tokens built on the Bitcoin blockchain or on the Ethereum blockchain, again, that's some of the underlying layer two. Um, the need to pay layer two token transaction fees with a little bit of the underlying layer one is both useful and annoying, sort of depending on how you look at it. If you're sending a token that represents one collectible baseball card, you'd find yourself definitely wanting to use such a system because paying 15 uh, cents worth of a token that you already think of and treat like money um, is very different than suddenly finding yourself with 0 0.9947 of your collectible, which requires one to actually be useful within the system. Um, at the same time, the need to use and manage two types of tokens is incredibly annoying and a huge barrier to entry for anybody who isn't already interested in cryptocurrency, which is a really big problem for adoption. Um, uh, so again, the advantage of a layer one token is that it's always money, right? It's always money. The difference is, is that you can't just create it ad finitum. Uh, you know, uh, just can't create it as much as you want. And uh, there are kind of limitations on all of those things. Um, another difference is that, like I said, the native token is typically fully automated and the control decentralized across multiple unrelated parties since the issuance and utility is baked in as the underlying blockchain. Are there any questions about any of this? I know this is some fairly dense material. Nope. All right. Cool, okay, so <laughs> now we're gonna get into the even more complicated stuff. All right, so smart contracts as they relate to tokens. Another way to look at and differentiate between tokens is the way that they accomplish their goals and what capabilities are actually available to them. There are two broad approaches just to you know, summarize. Uh, what I call Lego assembly and uh, the anything you can imagine or implement type of approach. Um, 
Before Ethereum, all approaches were some form of Lego assembly. In these systems, the rules very clearly define what a token is, how it works, and what it's capable of doing. Someone creating a token gets to choose its name, control its issuance and distribution, and decide whether they want those predefined features to be turned on or off. But all tokens created in such systems are fundamentally the same, just with a few different variables. To think of it another way, in this system, all tokens are marbles. Someone creating a new one might be able to pick what color it is, what design it has on it, its si but its size and its weight and its shape always remain the same. And with those fundamental characteristics, the same, it means that regardless of the branding or creation or purpose, all such marbles or all such tokens are going to work predictably and uniformly within a system that ma matches that standard. So while it's easy to build in that type of a system, uh, it also is majorly limiting. Um, effectively, even if you're the best person at building with Legos, ultimately you're still building with Legos and there are limitations inherent to that. With the introduction of Ethereum, we saw the first viable smart contracting language, which opened up token creation and function to whatever could be imagined and built. In an Ethereum-style smart contract approach to token creation, you can literally do anything, which is both very powerful and very dangerous. Technically, smart contracts create L2 or meta tokens, but because of the you can do anything caveat with smart contracts, it's possible to have L2 tokens which don't need to follow that rule like I was telling you about requiring the L1 to pay the underlying. So the way that you can solve that problem and the way we've seen a couple of people attempt it, I don't know if there are actually any of these uh, out there working, but it's very possible, uh, is to create a smart contract that allows people to effectively automatically tap into a liquidity provider where you're paying, you know, you're paying, uh, you know, an extra 15 cents or whatever, and that 15 cents gets split off, and then somebody else in the background converts it into Ethereum, and then gives it back and pays the fee for you. So that's a simplification from a user standpoint, but from like a complexity standpoint, it's an exponential increase. And so that is inherently the challenge with smart contracts: is that they are very, very powerful, but that power comes at an enormous cost to the ability to be sure that what you've done isn't going to wind up blowing up in your face. Um, so in practice, while it's possible to do anything with smart contract defined tokens, standards have become, excuse me, um, standards have become kind of more common and are really frankly needed to ensure things like wallet compatibility and stuff like that. You really want all the tokens that are just tokens to be marbles and you know, not, not like a dice, right? A square something that isn't going to roll through that system and it's just going to break everything it goes through. Um, so talking about some token standards, do I have that up here? No, that's not it. Um, so talking about some token standards, on the Ethereum side, there's the ERC-20 standard, which is the basic equivalent of the kind of other static tokens that I've been talking about. Um, and ERC-721 is this idea of non-fungible tokens, or what are called NFTs today. Um, and then you can build standards on top of standards. So looking at something like ERC-223, it's ERC-20 with additional safety features baked in so that you can't send tokens to an address that won't be able to use them because there are problems with that with layer two tokens and stuff like that too. Um, it's a very complex sp uh, space to really understand the capabilities and kind of what things are good for. Um, smart contracts aren't just used for creation of tokens though, which we'll get into when we talk about DAX and DAOs shortly. The biggest challenge with smart contracts today is the newness of the technology and the complexity of what can be built. Simply put, we're living in a world where best practices haven't really existed until quite recently, and the overwhelming majority of what's being built is still firmly in the realm of experimentation, if for no other reason than technical limitations at this point. We're still really working on how can we roll these systems out in a fully decentralized way to an early majority type of crowd without killing them on user interface or killing them on you know, scaling, and there's a bunch of challenges on all those sides too. Um, for more advanced use cases, there are, uh, there's another challenge too, which is that blockchains only know about events which happen and are recorded on their blockchain. Um, so any smart contract which relies on information which isn't directly generated by a blockchain has to trust whoever's putting that data into the blockchain for it to see and react to it. And that creates a central point of failure where if you compromise that source going in, then you can basically make the smart contract into almost a weapon against what its intended purpose is. Um, and uh, you know, again, like I've been building in this, I've been building with with tokens and things like that for at this point five years, and I've never felt comfortable enough to really go down the rabbit hole into the Ethereum side, just because every time I've I've 
every time I've tried, every time I've talked to somebody who has, like once you get into the really complex use cases, we just don't know how to do it yet. And I'm not that guy who's gonna figure that out. So for me, it's much easier to use, even as a relatively technical user, easier to use something that defines very clearly what a token is. So if you're thinking about using something on Ethereum, my suggestion would be to use one of the standards and not deviate from that unless you're really, really confident in your ability to execute. Okay, um, efforts like the Mastering Ethereum book or OpenZeppelin.com are good places to get started for best practices, template contracts, simplified SDKs, and starter kits that combine the two. Um, Mastering Ethereum is Andreas's book, and I highly recommend it. He's fantastic at writing about these topics, and uh, Gavin Wood is also uh, the co-author on that, also very good with this stuff. But um, OpenZeppelin can't really recommend that highly enough. Um, it's a totally open source project, and uh, really they have been doing most of the high-level audits that have been happening within the space and have, pl have played a large role in kind of the maturity of the smart contract space, and they do have a lot of very useful resources in the tutorial. So if you're thinking about getting started with something more complex on Ethereum, I was just making sure you check out that resource at least. Are there any questions? Uh, OpenZeppelin.com, so like an airship. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes? Yeah, so, um, so the ERC system, I believe, uses GitHub as their primary repository. So I am not an Ethereum expert enough to be able to tell you that short name, but I think that if you go looking for uh, ERC on GitHub, then you will find the comprehensive list. And certainly the other place to try would be the, um, would be the Ethereum Reddit, uh, which has great links to all of those things. All right, any other questions on smart contracts? You? Okay, moving on to DAX and DAOs. All right, with an ERC-20 or ERC-721 smart contract, the whole point of the smart contract is to create and manage the token. Smart contracts, however, as I said, can be much more complex than that, and so I'd like to briefly discuss Distributed Autonomous Corporations, or DACs, and uh, Distributed Autonomous Organizations, known as DAOs, excuse me. Um, of the two, unmanned companies, or the Distributed Autonomous Corporation concept, came first with uh, Daniel and Stan Larimer publishing several articles about it in the second half of 2013. Uh, Daniel would go on to launch ProtoShares, BitShares, uh, Steemit, and most recently EOS. So he has had a very, very impactful uh, space. And this was kind of his original thesis. And you know, I'm not gonna read through all of these as they're up there, but uh, the reality of it is, is that while this might sound complex, it's actually just another way of looking at Bitcoin or any automated L1 blockchain. Um, as time went on, this theory became practice, and as theory became practice, it became obvious that while a DAC might eventually be something that could truly be out of their creator's control and thus not their responsibility to be compliant with, um, in the early days, the company developing it typically raised money and then deployed that money themselves, and basically it was a security. So <laughs> this is a, a common theme we're going to see over and over again. Um, so again, the idea here, distributed autonomous organizations transpose this sort of level one uh, DAC idea to an L2 smart contract, which were arguably easier to claim as a decentralized from the company developing, since the smart contract software was already launched with Ethereum, and they typically didn't have to raise a bunch of money in advance to create the smart contract. Um, but it still did have kind of all of the same problems. While the reasons and systems may vary here, fundamentally, ICOs, STOs, DACs, DAOs, and a whole bunch of other things were and are different vehicles for raising money. And that is a very, very important factor in all of this stuff. In the early days, this was arguably a very exciting thing because while Bitcoin had emerged from a literal nothing, taking no funding, paying no team, never seeking publicity, distributing all the token via mining, that was not an easily repeated or often repeated pattern. The thought was that if Bitcoin had achieved success with, with such humble resources, adding funding to similar projects would get even bigger faster. Things quickly did get very big, and one of the largest early projects, known simply as the DAO, would demonstrate just how powerful and dangerous the idea of big money plus code as law would be. So just going through a couple of high-level points about the DAO, who here is familiar, you know, highly familiar with the DAO? Okay, so maybe 40%. All right, so um, just again going over the brief stuff. Uh, the DAO raised about $150 million worth of Ethereum, or Ether, in the spring of 2016. The more DAO you invested, effectively the more say you had in the choices or directionality of the DAO. 
Um, the DAO had no real kind of goal or desired outcome. At the start, its purpose was to collect money into the smart contract, which funders could then vote to invest into specific projects. Um, a to this day unknown individual or group found and exploited a mistake in the smart contract, which in short allowed them to steal most of the ether which had been invested into the DAO. And this led to kind of a cascading series of concerns within the early Ethereum community that that kind of loss at such an early stage in the life cycle of Ethereum um, could not be allowed to stand basically because it could destroy confident, confidence in the Ethereum network. Um, so the blockchain we think of as Ethereum today was actually rewritten to undo the damage done by the DAO. And the blockchain today known as Ethereum Classic is actually the original Ethereum chain which just never undid it. Um, from a kind of the rest of the world standpoint, the DAO had several major impacts. First, it made everyone understand how serious smart contract security and best practices really are, which inspired a new industry of, smart, uh, <laughs> which inspired a new industry of specialized smart contract audits and uh, sort of the open Zeppelin type people. That was exactly where they got their start and what was their impetus. Um, secondly, it scared most people off of truly autonomous smart contracts, DACs or DAOs, because if it's truly distributed, then problems which emerge can't be easily fixed without broad consensus. Most of the time when you see a token launch today using a smart contract, even a simple token, it'll launch with the ability to lock transfers of the token at a centralized, you know, the company can lock transfers. And as we saw in ERC-777, uh, actually I didn't talk about that, but in ERC-777 there are uh, even ways where you can have a token that allows the central issuer to make transfers on behalf of users. Um, and so again, these are all kind of things because we're scared that we don't know how to use these things and making them truly decentralized means that they're really out of our control. And so that can lead to bad outcomes and everybody's kind of trying to prevent bad outcomes. But it's, it's a really hard thing to do because as you put that control back in, all of the advantages of using something as a DAO or a DAC or any sort of decentralized institution disappear since you really do have the control center, centralized at the, uh, the company that's, that's manufacturing it. Um, are there any questions about this? Nope, okay, moving on. Um, ICOs and STOs. Uh, so I mentioned earlier that DACs, DAOs, ICOs, I'm sorry, I want to see. Right, not yet, okay. I mentioned earlier that DACs, DAOs, ICOs, and STOs are all about raising money. To, um, to anyone who's looked at the industry, this is probably obvious, but the reasons why tokens are such a good vehicle is not necessarily as obvious. In the early days of ICOs, they were simply an extension of the crowdfunding approaches that we had seen on, on Kickstarter to tokens or cryptocurrency. The analogy seemed really obvious and really clean. Imagine that you'd invented a new better kind of 3D printer, but in order to get the product manufactured, you need to have at least 500 effectively manufactured, uh, and those need to be paid up front. Traditionally, the way that you would solve this problem is you go to the fundraising world, and they take a lot of equity, because basically you're asking them to take a lot of risk. Um, you're asking them to pay to produce 500 of something when you haven't actually sold any of them. So crowdfunding offered a better solution for that in that instead of going to investors, you actually went to potential customers and you validated the product by pre-selling the product. And so that made it uh, actually much easier than to go back to investors because instead of them investing into something that was a big risk, it had already been validated. So it seemed like a real kind of win-win. Um, you take all of that and you apply it to blockchain or token projects, replace 3D printers with blockchains or products built on top of them, and instead of a pre-order, you actually get the token immediately and can do whatever you want with it. The analogy seemed clear, but in hindsight, it was just misleading, <laughs> as the differences kind of illustrate. One of the differences is, the primary difference is transferability. Um, Kickstarter pre-orders are not transferable, which to me always seemed really annoying but as I've come to appreciate the kind of uh, token side of it better, I actually understand why they did it. Uh, mostly, and this is a theme that repeats over and over again as well, it's about trying not to open cans of worms. Um, Kickstarter, so when something isn't transferable, it basically makes it so that it isn't sellable. And when something isn't sellable, the reason why you buy it isn't because of profit motive. And so profit motive here turns out to be really, really important. Um, so with Kickstarter, there's almost always a discount, but never a profit motive, because you can't resell the item, and that again is very important to this, the Howey test. So these two elements make traditional rewards-based crowdfunding fundamentally and basically irrevocably different than token-style fundraising. We know now, although perhaps we should have always known, that people invest in tokens. Because of this, tokens used successfully for investment or for fundraising are almost always an investment from a legal standpoint which has some major legal repercussions. The US determines whether or not something is an investment using what's called the Howey test. And I have it up on the stage there. 
but basically, uh, part one is it's an investment of money or other assets uh, in some cases. Uh, two, there's an expectation of profit from the investment. Three, the investment of money is in a common enterprise. And uh, four, any profit comes from the efforts of a promoter or third party. The Howey, the Howey test basically says that if it looks like an investment or acts like an investment, or if people investing in it behave like it's an investment, then it's treated as an investment. And so there have been lots of people who have sort of tried to figure out cute ways to get around that, but the fact that it's not about anything specific and it's really just about how do people feel about this and how are they behaving about this and what would the average person think when they see this makes it so that almost all of those approaches are not actually viable and haven't worked in practice. Um, so if you fail that, if, you, if the Howey test determines that you are a security, then what that means is that you have to comply with securities law. And that means that you have to comply with all of the rules around fundraising. And what we didn't know in the early days, but what we do know now, is that the reason why it's difficult to fundraise has very little to do with the vehicle that you are using to fundraise and almost everything to do with the rules and requirements around compliance um, uh, that surround fundraising. And so we thought <laughs> that tokens solve that because it was kind of unclear uh, that you had to apply the law here, but in hindsight, it's become more clear that actually that is the case. So it's, it's odd because it means that most of everything that we've seen so far could have happened in traditional equities if they had ignored the law and if the uh, regulations hadn't actually been enforced on them until years after the fact, which is the, the situation that we had here. Uh, you know, as somebody who was in the space, all through that time, I can tell you that that uncertainty was terrifying. And it's the reason why I never wound up launching a token, although I did profile and we spent over a year preparing a standard ICO and then a Reg D506B ICO, which I'll talk about in a little while. Okay, so with all that as context, are there any questions before we get into the specific types of token launches? Nope, okay, moving on. So the first type is uh, unregulated ICOs, and this is the traditional style of ICO. Uh, it was the original approach where anyone can, uh, where you basically have an idea or maybe a basic proof of concept and then you promote it and you do a token sale. The upside of this approach is that everyone can participate privately anywhere in the world and financial inclusivity was a very important early idea about ICOs. As I've said though, these were mostly not compliant with the laws that surround and make fundraising difficult and as it's become obvious that this doesn't really work, we're not really seeing these anymore. Um, the second thing is utility token ICOs. So when it was figured out that we couldn't do standard ICOs, people were like, well, this isn't a fundraising vehicle. This is actually, you know, prepayment of something or something or, you know, whatever. There are lots of things that people claimed as utility tokens. I did too myself, actually. Um, I, uh, my LTB coin uh, rewards token, I said that was a utility token. But again, in reality, the only thing that saves me from exposure there is that I never sold it. And so there was never any sort of investment of money. It was always something we created for free and then we gave out for participation, which at the time we thought was a safer route. And now it turns out might be the route to go if you want to do something non-monetary. Non um, so things that are important for utility token ICOs, in theory, if there is such a thing, is that the system already works and the tokens are useful today. Uh, two, the tokens aren't purchased as investments, but instead by users who want to use them rather than resell them. Uh, three, the tokens aren't able to be purchased in investable amounts. This is a really important thing that the uh, SEC has come out and said recently, not too recently, but they've come out and said that basically if you're presenting it in a way where somebody who might use, you know, $20 worth of the service over the course of a year, uh, winds up putting $10,000 into it, then very clearly that's, they're treating it as an investment rather than treating it as something that they want to use themselves. Um, and uh, finally, uh, basically everyone who wanted to do an unregulated ICO, like I said, tried to find a way to call uh, their project a utility token, but it's really hard to find those outside of L1 projects like Bitcoin or Ether. You can realistically think about uh, a Bitcoin as a utility token because it has a very specific utility. The system's already out there that works. It doesn't take an investment of money, um, but it does take you know, money if you want to buy it. But mostly it's, again, it's about the system already being out there and working. The approaches so far have attempted to avoid the attentions of US securities regulation, but with limited success. More recently, we've seen a great many projects attempt to work with regulators to create securitized token offerings, which have the support of US securities law rather than being at their mercy. The downside of working with regulators at by, is that by any standard, it's much more expensive to be legally compliant than not. So the easiest way to do, the cheapest, easiest way to be compliant in the US is to simply not take any money from anyone in the US. <laughs> <laughs> to be certain that is true, fundraising projects need to identify through, you know, know your customer and, you know, getting 
validating identities and stuff like that, who their investors are, wherever they are in the world, to be able to then prove to the U.S. regulator that you haven't taken any money from anybody in the U.S. So even though it's easier to not take money from the U.S., you still have these kind of onerous requirements for everybody else, even though it doesn't apply. And there's also un uh, a lack of clarity around what happens if an American comes in and lies to you or uses a false um, identity and like you did your best, but you still have an American. As far as the regulators are concerned in the U.S., that gives them jurisdiction and would uh, invalidate this. So it's, it's a tricky way to go if you go that way. Um, the other way to go, and what I had spent six months preparing uh, in 2017, um, is a uh, private uh, STO uh, or a Reg D506B. There are a couple of different exemptions in the, in the, in the uh, Reg D section. There's actually four different ways you can do it, but this is the one that we see most common and it's the one that's kind of the most useful. Um, Reg D is like a half step between a traditional ICO, uh, sorry, between a STO and a traditional private fundraising round. Of the two highly regulated approaches, Reg D is much cheaper, but also much more limited in what's possible. Reg D allows you to privately, as a token issuer, uh, discuss your offering and potentially take investment from accredited investors, which uh, is defined as individuals who have a net worth of more than a million dollars excluding the value of their primary residence, or who have made more than $200,000 uh, in each of the last two years, or if you're married, then you and your spouse making $350,000 over the course of a year qualifies you. Um, so that's, that's the limitation. You're not allowed to talk about it publicly. You're not allowed to tell anybody about it. Um, it's very difficult to do these. And what I really discovered when I was uh, preparing to launch one of these is that the reasons to do it are almost nothing. Like it's, you take all the advantages that you gain from the liquidity and the access and everything else of that from tokens and from kind of the early ICOs and to get to a reg D you strip out everything. And I mean, just like literally everything. And for a long time, I was like, why would anybody ever do one of these? And I realized in talking with an investor that it's actually because I'm coming at this from a token first standpoint. And other people are coming at it from an equity or traditional um, investment standpoint. And if you look at it from a token standpoint, it looks like you've just chopped the legs and arms off this thing. But if you're looking at it from a traditional equity standpoint, it's a way that you can go public without actually having to get listed on the New York Stock Exchange or something similar to that, which is a big barrier and a very big expense. So the downside with all of these approaches that I'm talking about here, really except for the, uh, the traditional, definitely not legal ICO approach, um, is that you can't use it to raise money for things that you haven't already built. And that was the big point of ICOs. We were like, well, We've got all this distributed wealth because, you know, there'd been crypto appreciation and people wanted to see these things happen. But that approach, we find, because of the way that, that uh, you know, fundraising is regulated, is not legal. And so all of these other approaches that we see require that you go in with something like $100,000 on the low end. And more realistically, you're probably talking about, again, for the one we're going to talk about next, you're talking about a million dollars or more to actually do the diligence and prep and get there. So it's more realistic now than it used to be. <laughs> but as we see, the opportunity is, again, not about the technology. The opportunities were always about the fact that we got to ignore the stupid rules built around fundraising that made it so expensive and difficult to fundraise. Not to say that there's not a reason for those rules, but it is to say that the way that they're applied definitely has negative points just as it has positive points. Okay, any questions so far? Yes. No, block stack is what we're talking about next. Blockstack, yeah, Blockstack is a Reg A public. It's a Reg A plus public. Actually, the Reg A was the original, and then the Reg A plus was the amended version that was uh, put into force a couple of, a little bit later. So if the Reg D is an easier, cheaper, more limited path forward, then a Reg A plus is the harder, more expensive path that everybody wants to follow, but basically nobody has except for Blockstack. Um, and that is in large part because Again, the onerous nature of the process, and then also it requires proactive approval from the government. And that is, again, a very different thing than typically what, what we see. Um, so the, the advantages of a Reg A+, plus, though, are profound. Uh, with this set of exemptions, a company can raise up to $50 million from anyone, anywhere in the world, whether they're accredited investors or not, with some limitations. People who are not accredited investors have limitations based on their income where they can invest more than 10% of their yearly income or something like that. Um, and again, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a financial professional, I'm just a guy who's been you know, walking down this path for a long time. So if you do plan to go this way, certainly you need to hire several lawyers. <laughs> uh, several, yeah. 
Um, if you're going to go the reggae plus, that's like a team of lawyers type of thing, you know, hundred, like a million dollars plus just to kind of get past the, uh, past the gate. And then you still need approval at the end of the process, uh, which might not be granted depending on what you've done. And interestingly, while you can talk about it publicly with the block stack example, we've seen that although they're allowed to talk about it publicly, they're very restrained in terms of what they can say. They need proactive prior approval from the regulator before they make uh, information releases. We saw their token launch. Uh, start at the beginning of August, and for the first time in my experience with token launches, uh, there was no thermometer or no sort of indication of if anybody had bought any at all, which in the early days of cryptocurrency, in the early days of ICOs, really was the thing that got people to, to buy in. Now I think there's a limitation in terms of, uh, like there aren't that many things that are actually good out there. Uh, to look at, and there's a lot of stuff that um, you know raised a lot of money and now is kind of struggling still to find its feet, and that's Unfortunate, but not that surprising because again, these are people who largely raise money built around ideas And as you dig more into those kind of high-level ideas you find out all the problems And again what I found in all of the stuff that I've built is that many of the problems have nothing to do with the technology The technology is there. It's just the permission and the regulatory systems that make it impossible in some cases to do what is now possible so and finally, token distributions that don't involve any investment of money, which uh, might not be securities. <laughs> and I say might not because this is a precedent right now. Um, last November, uh, there was a court case, I believe in California, where an ICO had tried to raise money, but they hadn't actually raised any money, but they had given away some of their token as, uh, through bounty campaigns. And so a bounty campaign is traditionally what happens in the cryptocurrency space where you, you say, well, here's our white paper, we'll pay somebody 100 tokens to translate it to, ch to Chinese or something like that. And so it's a contribution, but it's a non-monetary contribution. And again, depending on how you define this stuff um, and what precedents you're looking at, Sometimes you don't need a monetary contribution, but in this particular court case, um, the, uh, the regulator went after uh, the company anyways, and the judge found that because they hadn't actually taken any money, the, you know, the bounty stuff didn't count and didn't turn them into a security inherently. So that's a, strong, that's a good precedent, um, and it does mean that things like the LTB coin rewards program type thing, where I wasn't using it as a way to raise money, but I was using it as a way to replace money. I was using it as a way to replace money so that I didn't need to pay people in money because I didn't have the money to pay them. So instead we gave them this token that basically when I would go on to sell the network two years later, uh, as part of the deal where I sold the network, there was an end of life where that token was converted into a token that was being launched by the, um, by the company that bought it, which was BTC Incorporated or BTC Media. Um, and so that uh, we had an end of life where over the course of about a year and a half, uh, about 60% of the tokens that had been sent out uh, over the course of the prior three years to, you know, I think it was like, I think we wound up sending them to 10,000, 12,000 people, something like that, um, through weekly distributions. Right, so, so yeah, so doing it in that fashion uh, basically looks like, based on the current precedent, that it is actually allowed, and you can use it in place of money in some circumstances, but the caveat to that is that a further court precedent could reverse this and this might not wind up being anything other than a false positive. So that's the world that we live in right now, unfortunately, um, is there really are no best practices about this and we're really just starting to understand the regulatory landscape. Um, and uh, you know, one, one word of note is that I worked with both cryptocurrency lawyers for a little bit and uh, traditional startup lawyers for most of the time. And the reason why I didn't launch any ICOs was because I worked with traditional startup lawyers and they threatened to quit when I tried to launch uh, an ICO for a functional product that we had already built and had already done and everything like that in the September of 2017. Um, so as somebody who's kind of lived through all of this, helped people raise money with ICOs, we helped a couple of games, sell game pieces and stuff like that through our e-commerce systems and things. Um, it's been really interesting watching this, but I think that really what's happened is that it's been a huge distraction and it's really not the opportunity that people think it is. And again, it has nothing to do with the technology. If it was just about the technology, we're there. We've been there for four years. And the infrastructure that didn't exist when I was starting LTB coin does exist now, whether you're talking about the stuff that I've built or the stuff that other people have built. So the challenges here, unfortunately, aren't ones that we can really solve with technology. It takes projects like Blockstack, which raise a stupid amount of money, and then go and spend you know, a year and a half of their time trying to figure out how to do this type of you know, legal fundraiser that allows them to offer it to people who aren't accredited investors and already rich. 
um, you know, like it's, it's very challenging. So that's what I would say is that when you're thinking about token systems these days, you should be thinking about token systems that don't re revolve around fundraising. Or if you are thinking about token systems that revolve around fundraising, you shouldn't be thinking about it unless you have capital upfront in order to pay for the diligence and be legal with this. The way we're seeing the SEC work is they're going after low-hanging fruit, and I anticipate that's all they'll ever go after. The reality is, is that they were lax enough in terms of, uh, you know, proactively going out and talking to people who were doing these things publicly. Um, or, you know, noticing that this had happened before, you know, like three years after it had all exploded and everything, you know. I, it just again, like, the, I, I feel like there's, um, there are reasons why that's how regulators are, but if regulators had come in and said more strongly that, you know, fundraising laws apply to tokens, then we would not be in the situation that we're in right now. And the situation we're in right now is that anybody who did a fundraiser using these methods that were thought to be okay at the time and recommended by many crypto lawyers at the time, uh, are not okay, and they are at risk to have you know the money that was raised forced back to the people through a process called disgorgement, um, and that's very challenging for a lot of these projects, which have already spent a lot of the money. Uh, so there's like a lot of uncertainty around a lot of these projects, and it's again not entirely the fault of the regulator, but the regulator could have prevented it, and they're the ones who actually know these rules, which are incredibly complex, as we've seen. I think B2B stuff is a lot safer than B2C stuff, because B2B, you can, you're talking typically about larger volumes, and so the investable amount versus the utility amount is a little bit fuzzier. Um, ultimately, there are no rules about this, and I can't predict what the regulators are gonna do. My assumption is that you know, they're in it to protect people, and they're in it to protect the financial system. And protecting the financial system and protecting people, not necessarily the same goal. So we run into this problem a lot in cryptocurrency. You know, it just is what it is. But uh, the thing about Ethereum, to your other question, um, so uh, Ethereum, because of the time that it launched, because of the amount of distance that we have from that launch, and because of the subsequent decentralization, does make it seem like it has more decentralized characteristics, although you can make arguments the other way, too. Um, uh, that's typically not the case for most of the other projects we've seen launch. And so, like, they're still really in the process of building it, right? In the process of launching it, in the process of finding users who actually want to use the utility, and that makes it a lot more challenging. Great, thank you very much for your time.